Hi everybody. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about Takabudi in the 19th century and draw upon historical research that I did with Winifred Glover. So Takabudi was the first Egyptian mummy to come to Ireland. Her arrival in Belfast in 1834 caused great excitement and her unwrapping the following year was the equivalent of a modern day media spectacle. The mummy and her finely painted coffin were purchased at a mummy market in Thebes, which is modern Luxor, by a Mr. Thomas Gregg of Ballymenock House in Hollywood County Down. Now, many Egyptian tombs were robbed over the years because mummified remains were prized as the souvenirs of wealthy travellers. So Gregg was a wealthy young man whose father, uh, Cunningham Gregg, was the High Sheriff of Antrim in 1828 and then Thomas himself took on this role in 1840. The reason for his trip to Egypt remains unknown, but we think it may have been because it was part of his grand tour. Now, this would have been customarily undertaken by wealthy young men at that time as part of their education. It would have involved an extensive tour through Europe, but some people did go as far as Egypt. Now, fortunately, Greg did not keep Takabudi um, for his own personal amusement, but rather he gifted um, the mummy to the Belfast Natural History Society for its collections. So the Belfast Natural History Society was founded in June 1821 by a group of young men who were led by Dr James L Drummond, who was the Professor of Anatomy at the Academical Institution in Belfast. Its purpose was basically to promote the natural sciences. So later they were joined by others, including the Reverend Thomas Dix Hinks, um, and he had been appointed the master of the classical school at the Academical Institution in 1821. And importantly, he was the father of the Reverend Dr. Edward Hinks, who played an important role in Takabuti's history. So as the collections grew, it was clear they needed their own building. And the Belfast Museum of Natural History, which was paid for by public uh, subscription, um, was opened officially on the 1st of November 1831, and it was located in College Square North, um, near the Academical Institution in the centre of Belfast. So the broadening interests of the society saw Irish antiquities and more exotic objects being added to the museum's collections, um, and the body and the coffin of Takabuti were a highly important acquisition for the museum. So the first public mention we have um, that tells us about the arrival of the Egyptian mummy was made on the 12th of April 1834 during a talk on hieroglyphs at a meeting of the society and the speaker drew the attention to the members of a mummy purchased by a gentleman from this neighbourhood which was expected to be soon added to the Belfast Museum. A draft letter then that was written on the 24th of October 1834 exists within the archives of the Public Record Office for Northern Ireland, um, PRONI, and it actually thanks Thomas Gregg for the highly valuable present of an Egyptian mummy. Also in PRONI archives is another draft letter, uh, this time to Reverend Dr Edward Hinks, and it indicates that the Society had originally planned to unwrap Takabuti on the 15th of December 1834, but they had then decided to postpone this because they found it imperative to have a glass case ready in time for receiving the mummy after unrolling. So Hinks was to play a key role in the unwrapping. So much of what we know about um, Takabuti's unwrapping is dependent on the accounts of um, reporters who witnessed, who witnessed the event. And we have two main uh, records published. So one was in the Belfast newsletter on the 30th of January and the other in the Guardian. These accounts tell us that the unwrapping of Takabuti took place on Tuesday the 27th of January 1835 in the upper room of the museum in College Square North and you can see that um, here in the slide the, then it was became called the Egypt Room. Um, we know that the, the proceedings uh, started at 11 a.m and that her unrolling was attended by um, eminent men who made up the Belfast Natural History Society and their invited guests. So this amounted to around 130 individuals in total. 
And the gravity of the event is captured in these newspaper accounts. And they record that the most intense curiosity was depicted on the countenances of all present. When the president had taken the chair and the mummy enclosed in its case was laid upon the table. So when the lid of the sarcophagus was removed, um, a Mr. John Campbell, who was a teacher of painting based in Fountain Street in Belfast, he made a colour painting of the wrapped body. And this is very important because it shows her bandages intact. Um, another bystander who is now believed to be Francis Davis was moved to write a long poem called On the Mummy in the Belfast Museum. And he had this printed on paper with a decorative edge on the 9th of February, 1835. And then it was also published in the Northern Whig newspaper several days later on the 12th of February. Um, several years later, he published um, a book of his poems and he included another poem about Takabuti in this. And it was, it was amounted to 11 verses and 13 pages long. So you can see she made a big impression on him. So it's reported that four members of the society, Dr. Marshall, Mr. Grattan, Mr. Getty and the Reverend Dr. Hinks were fully responsible for manipulating the body during the unwrapping. So they tell us in the, the reports that first the body was removed from the sarcophagus and then they proceeded to unroll it. Linen bands fastened by knots were untied and the outer wrapping which comprised a large scarf which was buff in colour and neatly fringed with blue beads that were now loose within the case were removed. They then say that this revealed bandages um, and they describe these as similar to the bandages used at the present day in surgery being strips torn from the entire length of the cloth from five to seven inches wide and about five and a half yards long. They then say the next layer consisted of wide pieces of cloth that were folded diagonally across the body and fastened together at the head and feet with what they call some glutinous substance. So initially they tried to remove this with alcohol, but since the underlying five layers were also fastened with um, the similar material, um, they ended up having to just cut them away. So at the time, they believed that the substance was molten uh, bitumen and they recorded that it entirely covered the head um, and that there was a compact mass of the substance in around the sort of shoulder area between the head and the neck. They then said that the, the limbs were individually bandaged and that pledgets of what they said was cotton had been placed between the legs and beneath the arms to keep them in their correct position. They noted that there was um, numerous remains of dead insects but also a living beetle at the size of a flea was discovered during the unwrapping. So the next phase of the process involved an examination of the body itself um, and they started at the top and sort of worked their way down. So they said the hair was um, very fine, about three and a half inches long, forming ringlets like those of children and of a deep auburn shade. Now, a lock of her hair was taken at the time of the unwrapping. It was tied with a blue ribbon and kept in a little cardboard box with a glass case. Uh, and you can see it up in the top left of the picture. And today this lock is still on display in the Ulster Museum. And you can see that even though the hair on Takabuti's head has become very discoloured, the little lock protected in its case still retains the natural auburn colour. So they noted that the eyes had been replaced with what they called balls of cotton. So we know, now know that's linen. Um, they also talked about her, the damage to her face um, and said the lips, cheeks and sides of, sides of the head had been um, damaged by the attack of insects and that you could still actually see the insect remains in the, in the holes in her flesh. So the Guardian account recorded how the lips had been tightly sealed originally um, and that they actually required sort of gentle separation with a knife so that they could see the tea and teeth and inside the mouth. They said the teeth were white, regular and very pretty and with one single exception, not an unsound one could be seen. And on the basis of the appearance of the teeth, they determined the age of um, the individual to have been not less than 20 or more than 30. So they also undertook a phrenological examination of the skull um, and this was undertaken by Mr. Patton, Patterson and Mr. Grattan. So this would have been a particularly fashionable technique at the time 
and it was believed that the shape of the skull could provide information about a person's character and mental faculties. Um, so they determined her to have been, been a person of much firmness and caution of character and of a high degree of intellectual capacity, but little or no taste. So turning their attention to the torso, they removed the sternum and a portion of ribs, and the body then was found to have been filled with a mixture of powders, probably pounded spices, of a very heavy aromatic odour. They observed that the arms lay alongside the body, with the hands lying on the upper thighs, um, and one of, they made comment that the foot was particularly small and beautifully shaped. The Guardian account indicates that following examination of the body, the Reverend uh, Dr. Hinks gave an explanation of the hieroglyphs and um, inscriptions on the coffin. And he was able to say that the coffin contained the remains of a woman named Kabuti. So this was later revised to Takabuti, that she had been the daughter of a priest of Amun. Um, she'd lived around 2,000 to 2,500 years ago. He determined that her parents were both dead when she died. Um, initially, he said she was unmarried, although this was revised at a later date because one of her titles, Lady of the House, indicates her married status as the joint owner with her husband of a substantial household. Now, Takabudi seems to have undergone a period of intense study in the month that followed her unwrapping, and an account in the Belfast newsletter on Friday the 13th of March reported that a series of papers had been read about the Egyptian mummy at a public session of the Belfast Natural History Society on the evening of Wednesday the 4th of March. So you can see a list here of the topics that were covered, but um, basically there was more information about the hieroglyphs um, and the mummification process. It was concluded that the bandages were actually made of linen and not cotton. Two different types of insects were identified and they were described as those that would have invaded the body, you know, when it had sort of dried out. Um, although there was a huge amount of debate amongst, you know, um, insect specialists of the day, um, and some incorrectly believed that the insects would have been alive when Takabuti was mummified. Now, it's very unfortunate that uh, the newspaper account and then a later summary published in this centenary volume um, are practically all that remain of these papers today. So as well as the detailed account of um, Takabuti's unwrapping, the Belfast newsletter also contained an advertisement on Friday the 30th of January, which informed the public that the mummy would be displayed unwrapped for four days. And after this time, the bandages would be replaced with the exception of those at her um, head and her feet, and that the mummy would then re remain on display in the Belfast Museum. So from the 1st of May 1837, the museum was open to the public for six days each week, and it was a very popular venue for the citizens of Belfast. Between 1845 and 1910, it was promoted as a special attraction with a reduced entrance fee on Easter Monday, Monday, because this was one of the main holidays of Belfast's working classes. So large numbers would have attended the museum in the morning, and then they would have gone to Botanic Gardens in the afternoon, afternoon to watch a hot air balloon ascent. And Takabudi was one of the greatest attractions for the Easter Monday crowds. So she has found her home in three different institutions since her arrival in Belfast in 1834. Um, at the end of the 19th century, there was a strong feeling within Belfast that the city authorities should erect a major museum to reflect the growth of the city. So the Belfast Free Public Library was opened on Royal Avenue on the 13th of October, 1888, and then it was rebranded as the Belfast Free Public Library Art Gallery and Museum. Um, on the 16th of July 1890. So much of the, the new museum's early collections um, stemmed from a donation by Canon John Granger in 1891, and they were displayed in what's called the Granger Room. On the 27th of July 1910, the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society gifted their collections to the city and the collections then moved to the Royal Avenue building. So you can see it in the top, top right here, and it's basically what we now know as Belfast Central Library. So we've got two photographs that exist um, from, from the time when Takabudi was in, in this building on Royal Avenue. So these were taken by A.R. Hogg. Um, one of them dates to 1917, and it's in the aftermath of a lecture by Arthur Dean. So you can clearly see Takabudi's coffin in the background in the, in the, in the Granger Room. 
Um, and you can see in the other photograph that her body and her the lower part of her coffin were displayed separately. So we're not sure if this is the Granger room or um, elsewhere in that building. So as early as 1909, the Corporation of the City of Belfast began making plans for a new uh, purpose built museum. But this uh, took a long time to actually come to reality, you know, because of events like the First World War. Um, and it was finally opened in 1929 at the Botanic Gardens. And today it still forms part of the Ulster Museum. And Takabudi would have moved to this site in 1928, you know, in advance of the opening of the museum. And she's been there ever since. So today Takabudi forms the centrepiece of the ever popular Egypt, Egyptian gallery in the Ulster Museum. She's been a part of the cultural life of Belfast for almost 200 years. And there's still huge local interest in this long dead woman from ancient Egypt. And no doubt this will be the situation for many years to come. Thank you.